believe, 44 days, gonna turn North Carolina red and send Kamala Harris back to San Francisco where she belongs. Now, now we have got some fantastic people here. Before we get started, I just wanna give a few shout outs to folks who have joined us today. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for being here, for caring enough about this country to get out and rally with us today in North Carolina. It's lovely to be here. I want to give, I want to give a, I want to give a shout out to Lieutenant Governor Nominee Hal Weatherman. Hal, where are you? Hal, thank you so much for being here. You guys have got an incredible crew of young Republican House candidates in the state of North Carolina. I believe there are five new congressmen coming to us from the state of North Carolina, and they're going to help us make America great again. We've got House Speaker Tim Moore. Tim, thank you so much. We've got Brad Knott with us. Thank you, Brad. We've got Addison McDowell. Where's Addison? Thank you, Addison. We've got the great Pat Harrington, the Navy SEAL. Green Beret, a Green Beret, not a Navy SEAL, Pat's gonna, he's gonna have words with me later. They're flying back with us on DC, to DC. And we've of course got the great Trump Force Captain here in North Carolina, Robert Gleason. Robert, thank you so much for having me on Now let's talk a little bit about why we need to send Kamala Harris packing because, you know, I, I don't know if y'all saw the news, but Kamala Harris still refuses to really talk to the American media. Now, I, think that's, I think that's interesting. It suggests maybe she's got something to hide, and we all know that what she's hiding from is that she is a dangerous San Francisco liberal, now pretending that she is a modern. But the record, ladies and gentlemen, speaks for itself, doesn't it? We know exactly who Kamala Harris is because she's been governed that way for the last three and a half years. Now let's talk for just a second about Kamala Harris's record, because she says now that she wants to support the police, but she ran for president three years ago saying she wanted to defund the police and make our communities less safe. She pretends now that she supports American energy, but for the last three and a half years, they have increased regulations on American energy. They have refused to do permitting reform. They have refu refused to do anything that would actually allow our great American energy producers to do their job to lower prices and to make our country less safe. Because here's the problem. When you go to war on American energy and you have a vice president who seems to hate her own energy producers, it's not just bad for the people who are producing American energy, and it doesn't just raise costs on consumers, though it certainly does that. It empowers some of the worst people in the world because they're all getting rich when Kamala Harris refuses to let American consumers buy energy from American producers. And how about this, Kamala Harris? Why don't we stop buying energy from tin pot dictators all over the world? Let's buy it from American workers right here at home. We've got it in our own territory, and we've got great workers who can get it out of the ground. As President Trump says, all we need to do is drill, baby, drill, and that will do more for American prosperity than anything. Drill, baby, drill, drill, baby, drill, drill, baby, drill, drill, baby, drill. Now, we, we, we of course have a lot of other economic problems in this country, but it is hard to talk about any of those problems without focusing on energy. I was actually just talking or asked backstage by a couple of local reporters, what is the most important thing that we can do to lower costs on American consumers? And the answer really is drill, baby, drill. Now here's the reason why, let's just, let's just sort of understand this a little bit. When, when you raise the cost of diesel on American truck drivers, well, who do you think is delivering the groceries to the grocery store? So you raise, you, you, you raise costs on those truck drivers, you make groceries unaffordable for American consumers. When you raise the cost of energy, American farmers can't grow food at the same, in the same way they were before, so that raises the cost of food on American consumers. When you make it harder for the truck drivers to get the lumber to the construction site, then you raise the cost of housing on American consumers. Every time that Kamala Harris, and there's been a lot of them, but every time that Kamala Harris has made, has made a decision that raises the cost of American energy, she has made basic middle class life 
less affordable for North Carolinians and people all across our country. And so on November 5th, we're going to say to Kamala Harris, the energy price raiser, you are fired. We're getting back to common sense energy policies. We're getting back to Donald J. Trump. Now, let's just go through some basic facts here on what Kamala Harris's economic policies have brought right here in the state of North Carolina. The cost of living in this state is up 22%. That means the average North Carolina family is spending about $12,000 more per year. $12,000 more per year, about $1,000 more per month, just to afford now what they could have afforded three years ago. Now, how does that make an ounce of sense? Make North Carolina families spend a lot more money just to afford what they could have afforded for a lot less three years ago. But that's Kamala Harris's economic policies. Inflation has cost the average North Carolina family over $30,000 since Kamala Harris took office. Gas prices are 30% higher today than when Kamala Harris took office, and home prices, especially here in Raleigh and some of the big cities, housing is completely unaffordable for young Americans, 56% higher thanks to Kamala Harris's policies. And I've got three kids, and I think I speak for the, all the parents and the grandparents out there, we want our young families to be able to afford the American dream of home ownership. That's why we've got to get Donald J. Trump back in the White House. Now, now, I would love for some of our reporters to ask Kamala Harris about some of these policies and why she did all the things that she did, and now she's running away from it. She has flip-flopped on literally every single proposal that she ran on in 2020. Now she says she doesn't believe. I mean, she practically is at this point where she could walk into this, this room right now and she could steal one of your red hats, sir, and put it on and say, make America great again, because Kamala Harris is practically just running on the Trump agenda right now. <laughs> but as much as she's running on the Trump agenda, she has been in office for three and a half years and she hasn't done a damn thing about it. Kamala Harris, stop talking about what you will do. Start talking about what you have done and the answer is not a damn thing. Now, now she won't talk to these reporters, of course. I think since she became the presumptive nominee, she has done all of two media interviews. And after we actually give, after I give some remarks here today, I'll take as many questions as we have time for, because I happen to believe that if you want to be the American people's president, you ought not be afraid of friendly American media. And that's exactly what they are, of course, to Kamala Harris. Think, think about this. How, how is she going to sit in a room with Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, how is she going to sit in a room with the adversaries of America if she won't even sit down for a friendly media interview? She can't do it. And we can't trust anybody who's so afraid of her own people that she won't give an interview to actually represent those, those people on the world stage. But here's, I will say, it's, there's a bit, uh, there's something selfish about it. Because part of the reason I want Kamala Harris to do more interviews is because there's so much comic relief in it. I, I, I really do believe that every time she answers a question, we gain about 100,000 votes. So I do selfishly wish that Kamala Harris would give more interviews to the North Carolina media because then I think the state wouldn't even be close come November. And I don't know if you've seen, my friends, some of these interviews that she gives, but they'll say, you know, well, Kamala, give us your specific plan. What is your exact plan for how you're going to lower the grocery, food, and housing prices for American citizens? And she'll, and she'll say, well, you, did you know I grew up in a middle-class family? <laughs> or, 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 or Kamala Harris, how are you going to bring peace to the world? Because for the last three and a half years, there seems to be a new war breaking up in every continent about every month in the world, how are you going to re re restore peace and stability to the world? And she'll say, well, did you know that when I worked at McDonald's, I was the best hash brown man <laughs> in all of McDonald's? Well, that's fine, Paula. I like McDonald's hash browns too, but that has nothing to do with what your plans are to fix the, pro the problems and the crises you've caused for the last three and a half years. We do not care, Kamala Harris, about how much you want to talk about yourself. 
We want to understand how you're going to fix the problems for the American people, the problems caused by your policies and under your laws. Now, we, we talk a lot about inflation and, and, and the economy, and justifiably so, because there are way too many American families struggling. And I want to say to anybody who's here today, anybody who's watching on TV, my friends, I understand that pain very personally because I myself grew up in a family where we very often lived paycheck to paycheck and a lot of times much worse than that. I remember the, the mammal who raised me, and I see you got my book there, ma'am, I appreciate it. Uh, available wherever bookstores are sold, so go out and get yourself a copy if you haven't yet. But I, I know there are a lot of mammals in North Carolina because there are a lot of Appalachian people in North Carolina. And we call our, our mammals and papals, our grandparents and grandparents, our grandmas and grandpas. But look, here's, here's the thing. I, I remember growing up with mammal, and I, I remember a couple of things in particular. You know, one is when times were really tight, and there was a particularly cold winter night, sometimes we didn't have the money to turn on the heating. And sometimes we plug in a space heater and just sit by it before we went to bed, or sometimes we throw a few extra blankets on. And I remember thinking, when I am a grown man, I, I don't really, you know, the American dream to me, it's not about writing a book, it's not about starting a business, it's not even about running for vice president as fun and as cool as this is. The American dream to me was I wanted to be able to give my kids the things that I didn't have when I was growing up. But, but I believe that we are a rich and prosperous enough nation that no American family should have to debate whether they can afford to turn on the heating in the middle of a cold winter night. I believe, I, I, I believe, love you too, I believe that we are a rich and prosperous, don't tell my wife, rich and prosperous enough nation that no matter where you grew up, or no matter where you're from, you ought to be able to afford a nice meal on a Friday night. And that is ultimately, when we say make America great again, that's what we really mean, is if you work hard and play by the rules, you ought to be able to afford a good life in the country that your parents and grandparents built. It's really that simple. You, this, is, this is not that complicated, and this is not that hard. But it becomes hard to heat your home at night when energy prices are 40% higher. It becomes hard to put that nice meal on the table on Friday when food prices are 25% higher. Let's get back to common sense and let's get back to giving every American citizen the good life they deserve. We can do it with better leadership, my friends. Now, now there, is, there is nothing, there is nothing more important, I believe, and it connects both to the economic issues, but it also connects to basic public safety, like Kamala Harris's wide open border. Because if you think about it, why have housing costs gotten so high? There are two basic reasons. Number one, Kamala Harris made it harder in this country to build homes, and she made it, she made it so that our interest rates shot through the roof. There are a lot of Democrats celebrating right now that they lowered interest rates by half a percent. But interest rates have gone up about 6% thanks to Kamala Harris's policy. That's number one, why housing prices are so high. The second reason that housing is so high is because we let in 25 million illegal aliens to compete against Americans for scarce homes. And here's the thing, when you take the same number of houses and you bring 25 million people who shouldn't even be here and you force Americans to compete against those 25 million, then that's going to drive up the cost of housing for everybody. we got to get those illegal aliens out of here and secure our border and that's the best thing that we can do to bring back housing affordability. Now, we've seen this, by the way, in the state of Ohio. We've seen this in multiple communities across the country. And there's this, this game that Kamala Harris and the Democrats play. The first thing that they do is they will flood a small town or a big city with thousands of migrants who shouldn't be there in the first place. And the second thing they'll do is they'll say, you are a racist if you dare complain about it. And I think it's the most disgraceful thing that Kamala Harris has done this cycle is not just flood this country with cheap labor and people who are competing with you for homes, but they didn't tell you that you're a bad person for daring to speak up and to have a voice about what's going on in your own country. We reject that politics. We reject that censorship. And, you know, 
what's, what's, what's interesting about it is that very often the people who have suffered the most from Kamala Harris's open borders are people of Latino descent or they're black Americans whose family has been in this country for nine or ten generations. In the town of, of Springfield, Ohio, which I'm honored to represent, we've heard from a number of residents that there are certain parts of town where they won't even drive because the illegal immigrants who have come in have made it unsafe to be on the roads. And you see the evidence of it, by the way, in skyrocketing car insurance rates. Whose car insurance rates have gone up? You think that has something to do with the fact that there are 25 million drivers on the road who shouldn't be here? And if they didn't follow our laws to get here in the first place, do you think they're following stop signs? Absolutely not. So the housing and everything else affordability crisis is connected to Kamala Harris's open border. And ladies and gentlemen, it did not have to be that way. All, I, I've been on the border twice, which is I think two more times than our borders are, Kamala Harris. And you know, the, the, the two times that I've gone, you know what really sticks out at me? Is the border patrol agents are heartbroken because all they want to do is to be able to do their job. And these people come from every walk of life. When I was last at the border, I, I spoke to a recent Latino immigrant, a legal immigrant to this country, who joined the border patrol because he wants to secure that southern border. You see every American from every possible walk of life, and they just want to do their job. Kamala Harris, why won't you just let them? It's that simple. So to everybody who wants us to have a secure border, we're going to say very simply that Kamala Harris's policy is to suspend deportations. Donald Trump is going to re-implement deportations. Yeah. Yeah. Kamala Harris's policy is to decriminalize all illegal immigration. Donald Trump's policy is to enforce the border and build the wall. to bankrupt Medicare by giving Medicare to illegal aliens, which would throw millions of American seniors into poverty, Donald Trump's answer is to send people home who came here illegally. It's that simple. Our message, our, our message to illegal aliens who have come to this country, who have driven up the cost of housing, who have made it more expensive for Americans to afford a good life, to the drug cartels who have brought in pounds and pounds, tons and tons of fentanyl into this country. Our message is simple. In six months, pack your bags because you're going home. And let me just leave us there because I want to talk a little bit about public safety because, of course, the border issue is so connected to our public safety, but it's not the only reason why we've had rising violent crime rates in this country under the policies of Kamala Harris. Now, just, just think about this. At the RNC convention, you all probably saw this, this wonderful young mother, beautiful woman with a handsome, probably 14-year-old kid who talked about her 14-year-old son dying of a fentanyl overdose. And how did he die of a fentanyl overdose? He died because he did what a lot of teenagers in this country do. He made a mistake, and that mistake was laced with fentanyl, and it took his life. And I remember after that woman's testimony, which was the most powerful thing I saw at the entire national convention, after that woman's testimony, there were a lot of these, you know, online social media trolls who attacked this woman for daring to speak about what was going on in the country and for daring to talk about her son. And they say nasty, hurtful things like, well, why was your son taking something bad in the first place? And I remember one thinking, what a disgusting person to say that to a young mother who just lost a child. But more importantly, don't all of us want our children to grow up in a country where they can make childhood mistakes and not have it claim their life? I, I'm, the, I'm the father. I'm the father of a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. And as every parent will know, kids, especially teenagers, don't do everything that you want them to, to do. In fact, my two-year-old doesn't do everything I want her to do. But we want our children to grow up in neighborhoods that are safe enough that kids can learn from innocent childhood mistakes and not have it claim their life. We want our children to grow up in safety and security. And whether you're a rich person or a poor person, we think the birthright of every American citizen is to grow up in safe neighborhoods and safe streets. And that's what we're going to bring to North Carolina and everywhere else when we get Kamala Harris 
out of the Oval Office. Now look, I, I, I cannot overstate how crazy this is and how we shouldn't be here. We should not be doing these things to our country. And we have so much going for us. We have the best people. I, I really do believe that we have the best workers, the best technology, the greatest historical traditions of any nation on the face of the earth. My friends, the one thing that we don't have is good leadership. We do not have a vice president who is fit to lead the greatest country in the world. So in just 44 short days, we get to send a message to Kamala Harris and everybody else, you are fired. Go back to your San Francisco home. You can act like a San Francisco liberal there, because we are going to elect Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. And what you can do is get as many people to the polls between now and November 5th as you possibly can. Get your friends and your family out there to vote. You know, I'm, I'm sure all of us have somebody in our life, maybe an, an elderly friend, an elderly family member, who can't necessarily drive to the polls. In fact, I've got a woman in my family who's, who's north of 90, and she is a weapon of mass destruction behind a car. But we got somebody, her, her daughter, who's going to make sure she drives to the polls before before November 5th. And we can all do that. We can all be a force multiplier. And here's the other thing that I want all of us to do. And I'm going to give us just a few seconds to do it right now. I want everybody to take out their phones, if you can. I'm sure most of us have phones in here. Um, and, and take out your phones. Take either a photo, take a selfie of yourself, take a photo of me while I'm up here. And I'm going to ask you to go to whatever social media you use, whether it's Facebook or X or anything else, and get out there and post that story. And not just post it, not just post the picture, but give one reason why you're going to vote for Donald J. Trump. Because we, we are never going to have the media behind us. We are never going to have the big tech oligarchs behind us. But what we do have in this country is we've got the truth behind us and we've got the power of people behind us. So let's get that people power out there. Let's march every single day. Let's knock on every single door. Let's make every phone call that we can and let's win this race and take this country back. Our country deserves better leadership and we're the ones who are gonna make sure they have it. God bless you guys, thank you. All right. Now, I think we've got at least five, ten minutes to take some questions from the reporters in the back. Uh, I would ask that we start out with local reporters, uh, and then if we've got time afterwards, we'll go to the national folks. Sir. Hey, Jeff Moore, Carolina Journal. Thanks for being here. I saw you at a football game this weekend, wondering as you work your way across the country, what your impression is about your interactions with voters in North Carolina and the policy successes of North Carolina over these last 10 or 15 years. Do you draw any inspiration there that you would like to take up to D.C.? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I guess my takeaway from, from North Carolina voters is, look, you, you guys have a great spirit here in North Carolina. You go to a foot, you know, I went to the ECU App State game, what do you call it, the, 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 cross, the cross state rivalry, is that what? So I, I went there and people were fired up, they were excited, and unlike an Ohio State Michigan game, nobody was fighting each other at the ECU App State game. So what I, what, I took, what I took away from that is that people here, they love their state, they love, you know, they love their football teams, but they can disagree with one another, they can argue about a football game or argue about politics and still be on the same American family. And I think that's a very unique and great thing about North Carolina. This is a state on the move. Right? This is a state with ambitious people. A lot of the folks that I meet, another takeaway from some of the folks I talked to in North Carolina is a lot of folks came here from other states. Right? There are a lot of North Carolina natives, but there are a lot of people who have transplanted here because of the great job opportunities. So this is a state where we're optimistic about the future, and I think people here recognize better than anybody that we are ready to unleash a great period of American spirit and American innovation. We just got to fire the current occupants of the White House and get somebody better in there. But, the, the, you know, a thing that I'll take from North Carolina, because... 
you know, we've actually, I've invested in companies in North Carolina before, and, you know, I, I, I care a lot about, and I've focused a lot on what's going on in, in innovation and technology here. I think North Carolina has shown that if you have common sense economic policies and you've got common sense energy policies, you can build an economy that is rapid, growing, and really, really exciting for all the residents here. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that if we've got broken federal policies in Washington, D.C. I mean, one way of thinking about the fundamental difference between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris's economic policies is that Kamala Harris wants to do the same old things that we've been doing. She just wants to bring in a lot of cheap labor to do it. Think about that. What is 25 million illegal aliens about? That's about cheap labor. And why does she want to subsidize shipping American jobs overseas? Because a Chinese slave will work for cheaper than an American middle class worker. What does Donald Trump and I want to do? We want to build the economy of the future with American workers, American innovation, and American manufacturing. I think North Carolina is primed to be at the lead of that if we get the leadership we need. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Sydney McCoy with Spectrum News One. So North Carolina has a lot of businesses, but we also have a lot of retirees, and sure. that's expected to grow as well. So do you guys have a plan to increase or decrease taxes on 401ks, especially for retirees? Well, one of the things the president just came out with last week, actually, is eliminating taxes on Social Security income, which, of course, would be huge for a lot of our retirees. And I think that, look, we, we, we have to recognize that as much as everybody has suffered under Kamala Harris's affordability crisis, the people who, who've often suffered the most, it's very often our grandparents, right? Because they're living on a fixed income. They can't just go out at 72 and get another job when times get really tight. They're not able to work as easily anymore, and we've got to respect that, and we've got to recognize that. We've also, because of the fentanyl, that Kamala Harris is allowed to come across the southern border, we've got a lot of retirees who are taking care of kids who have been orphaned by this drug epidemic, taking care of kids they weren't planning to take care of. And we love them for it, and we're grateful to them for it, but we've got to do a better job of supporting our grandparents, especially those who are taking care of families they weren't expecting to take care of. And you think about what it means to take care of a family on a fixed income when Kamala Harris's policies have led to groceries being 25% higher. That is a disaster. For retirees across the state of North Carolina. Well, let's say you know you want to take a vacation, you want to drive down to Florida, drive down to Alabama, to Gulf Shores, where I know a lot of people from North Carolina and Ohio, or you want to go out to the Outer Banks, but now gasoline is 35% higher than it was three years ago. There are a lot of people canceling vacations, canceling family meals, and canceling plans for the future because of this inflation. That is the best thing that we can do for our retirees is to cut it out, get back to common sense economic policies, and make America affordable again, especially for our retirees. Senator Vance, AP Dillon, yes, North ma State Journal, thank you for taking my question. You had talked earlier about energy independence. Uh, could you expand on that just a little bit more? Are we talking opening up gas leases? Or what does that have an impact for North Carolina? And how will that impact the, basically the eastern coast? Well, there are a few different things that we have to do. Number one, the Harris campaign, the Harris vice presidency has imposed a number of PowerPoint regulate, sorry, power plant regulations that are absolutely nonsensical and raise the cost of energy for North Carolina consumers. The second thing is we've got a lot of natural gas capacity uh, all across our country. We don't have the pipelines to get this stuff where it needs to go. And Kamala Harris has got to stop shutting down pipelines. We need to be opening up pipelines, lowering costs for American consumers and everybody else. I want to make one more point just very specifically because people very often don't realize the connection between energy and food prices. And it's connected in a whole host of ways. But you know one other way it's connected is, you know what the main fertilizer that we're using in our farms is derived from natural gas. So if you jack up the cost of natural gas, you're going to make farming more expensive. You're going to make food more expensive. And you don't want to know something really crazy and should scare all of us. As much as we've got going on in this country, we've got some very serious crises, and this is maybe the biggest. You know when the first time, the very first time I believe in the history of this country, that we became a net food importer? And you know what that means? That means that we're eating more food than we're growing. We've always grown more food than we've eaten in this country. You know the first full year that we became a country where we eat more than we grow? 2023, under the policies of Kamala Harris. 
So it's bad for our farmers. It's bad for anybody who goes to the grocery store. But this is a massive national security issue. The dumbest decision, I'm 40 years old, the dumbest decision made by American leadership in my lifetime was they decided that we didn't need to make our own stuff anymore. So a lot of things from the ibuprofen to the antibiotics to the manufactured goods, a lot of this stuff is made in China or somewhere else. It's a disgrace and we've got to stop it. But if it was a mistake to ship our industrial base off to China, then isn't it an even bigger mistake to ship our food supply to countries that very often hate us? This is craziness. So our plan is very simply, manufacture more in the United States of America, grow more food in the United States of America, self-reliance, American jobs for American workers. That is the path to prosperity and also to national security. Thank you. Ma'am. Hi, Senator. Lucille Sherman with Axios Raleigh. Um, you mentioned food and manufacturing industries. Deporting migrant workers could have a significant impact on a state like North Carolina, which relies on migrant workers for hog farming, crop harvesting, construction, and more. How would your administration address that? Well, first of all, if you talk to farmers, farmers are as upset about the open border as almost anybody else. So I think farmers, and certainly I reject the idea that the only way to have a productive farm economy is to allow 25 million illegal aliens into this country. It doesn't make an ounce of sense. Again, we cannot import cheap labor. We cannot import 25 million illegal aliens and expect that that is going to be the path to prosperity. It doesn't work like that. And we've now tried this for three and a half years. Think about it. The Kamala Harris argument is that if you let in millions upon millions of low wage illegal laborers, that is going to make everybody better off. Well, she's been running that experiment for the last three and a half years, and I don't think many of us feel better off, do we? So let's try a different approach, lean into the future, but do it with American workers and American products. Thank you all. Ma'am. Hi, Senator. Vivian Salama from The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for bringing us along. I have a quick uh, big picture and then one on news of the day, if that's okay. Sure. Um, just in terms of you joining the ticket with Donald Trump, with President Trump, uh, before you were a senator and you had your own independent views, some of which were a little bit different than his, maybe even a bit more conservative. Similarly, Vice President Harris was a senator and then uh, and you know she joined the ticket. She was a candidate briefly. She had a bit more left-leaning views than President Biden, and when she joined the ticket, she also moderated to be in line with him. So how do you distinguish between the two? Obviously, there is some daylight between what you were saying before and now that you're on the ticket, what you're saying as part of the Trump Vance team, similar to the vice president. So how do you distinguish that? So that's the first question. The second question is? Really quickly, just on the Fed cutting. It's a very Wall Street journal question, but the Fed cut the interest rate today by a half a percentage point going to alleviate inflation for a lot of people. And so if you have any reactions to that, we'd love it. Well, look, my, my, re my reaction is uh, my, 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 my reaction is a, a half a point is nothing compared to what American families have been dealing with for the last three years. You know, when, when, when Donald Trump, when, when Donald Trump, when Donald Trump left office, a lot of Americans were getting three, four percent mortgages. Now they're getting eight percent mortgages. A half a point is not going to help those families a whole lot. It's better than nothing. But again, the reason why we have sky high inflation, the reason why we have high interest rates is because Kamala Harris cast a deciding vote on the Inflation Explosion Act. And then she tried to do everything she could to shut down American energy. So Americans are suffering from this stuff. And the fact that the Fed is going to give them a little relief in the midst of an election, by the way, is nothing compared to the disaster that Kamala Harris's policies have caused in this country. So, on, 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 your, on your first question about, look, daylight between me and President Trump and Kamala Harris's daylight between Biden. First of all, there's one big difference on this account. And look, yes, I have changed my mind on things over the years. You know the difference between me and Kamala Harris is because is I actually stand in front of the American people and explain why. If you ch there's
There's nothing wrong with changing your mind in this country, but when you change your mind, you ought to explain to the American people why. It's that simple, and that is the big difference. Now, look, of course, do I agree with President Trump on every single issue? Of course, nobody agrees with any person on every single issue. You know what the difference is between me and President Trump? Number one, he got millions and millions of Republican primary voters. He is the leader of this party, and he sets the agenda. So, of course, So, so look, of course, of, of course, the difference, and, and it's funny that Democrats want to focus on this, the big difference between President Trump and Kamala Harris is votes. <laughs> he actually got the votes of Republican primary voters, and Kamala Harris never did. And again, the problem with Kamala Harris, if she wants to say she changed her mind, then she is entitled to do that, but only if she stands before the American people and explains why. Stop running from the media, Kamala. They won't bite. Answer some questions. Ma'am. Hi, Senator. Christine Zier from NC Newsline. So over the weekend, you went on Meet the Press to talk about what a proposed health care plan would look like under the Trump administration. Sure. Could you go into more detail about this specifically for North Carolinians and how it helped lower costs? Yeah, well, step back for a little bit, and the, the, the problem with American health care is actually that it works really well for most Americans, and it works really poorly for a lot, right? Um, so if, if you don't have major health problems, if you just go to the doctor a few times a year to check in, maybe if you got, you know, the flu or something like that, American health care actually works okay, but if you've got a serious condition, if you've got a chronic condition, that's where American health care is a complete disaster. And whether you're getting health care at the Veterans Administration, whether you're on Medicare, or whether you have private insurance, health care, if you've got a chronic condition, is a really, really significant problem. And we have got to fix health care for everybody, right? And look, the problem with, with what we've seen over the last few years is I talk to a lot of people, and the biggest complaint they have is they are paying more and more for health insurance premiums, and they're getting less and less out of it. Now again, if you only go to the doctor once a year for a physical, maybe that doesn't bother you as much. But if you're going to the doctor three, four, five, six, seven times a year, our healthcare system is a disaster and we have got to fix it. We really do. Now, in, in, in terms of specific plans, look, the biggest problem with our healthcare system right now is that you have a lot of federal regulations that don't make sense for the healthcare system that we actually have. That's number one. Number two, and so we're gonna, we're gonna actually implement some regulatory reform in the healthcare system that allows people to choose a health care plan that works for them. If you only go to the doctor once a year, you're gonna need a different health care plan than somebody who goes to the doctor 14 times a year because they've got chronic pain or they've got some other chronic condition. That's the, that's the biggest and most important thing that we have to change. Now, what that will also do is allow people with similar health situations to be in the same risk pools, so that makes our health care system work better. It makes it work better for the people with chronic issues. It also, also makes, uh, makes it work better for everybody else. Now, we also have to remember Donald Trump doesn't just have a plan on this stuff. Donald Trump has a record. And actually, when Donald Trump, even though Kamala Harris likes to take credit for this, it was Donald Trump who got the $35 insulin that made insulin affordable for American consumers. And the final point I make on this, one of the most expensive, significant health care costs in our country is, of course, prescription drugs. And remember what President Trump has said repeatedly, something that for some reason the Harris talks a lot about lowering the cost of drugs, but she never goes here, and the reason she doesn't go here is because she is in the pocket of Big Pharma. And what Donald Trump has said is that Europeans are paying way less for prescription drugs than Americans are. We should let companies bring in drugs from Europe, lower the cost of prescriptions for American consumers, and make everybody better off and healthier in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Senator. Mia McCarthy with Politico. Um, question for you about the Haitian migrants in Springfield. Um, so I know you've talked a lot about how we need to deport illegal aliens, but I wanted to ask you, the majority of the Haitians in Springfield came under TPS, um, so they are here legally. And I know you've expressed a lot of your issues with the TPS program and wanting to change that um, under a trump fans administration. But I guess my question for you is if you become the vice president under a Trump administration, what will you guys do about the migrants that are already there since they did arrive legally? Um, and a follow-up to that, 
if you plan to deport them, how would you do that legally? Well, look, th this is this is a media and Kamala Harris fact check that I want to I want to clarify and clear up right now. And here's now the media loves to say that the Haitian migrants. Hundreds of thousands of them, by the way, 20,000 in Springfield, but hundreds of thousands of them all across our country, they are here legally. And what they mean is that Kamala Harris used two separate programs, mass parole and temporary protective status. She used two programs to wave a wand and to say, we're not going to deport those people here. Well, if Kamala Harris waves the wand illegally and says these people are now here legally, I'm still going to call them an illegal alien. An illegal action from Kamala Harris does not make an alien legal. That is not how this works. And, and again, I just I want to focus our, our attention, my friends, on how much the media is gaslighting us and, and lying us to us about this. Parole. We have, let's get into the weeds a little bit, we have the, a parole power in our immigration laws. And what that means is the president or the vice president can use the power to basically say, this one person, we are going to parole them from complying with our immigration laws on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, maybe there's some reason. Maybe it's a, you know, somebody helped us overseas and their life is in the imminent danger. You could parole that person. What is fundamentally illegal is for Kamala Harris to say, we're going to grant parole, not on a case-by-case -case basis, but to millions of illegal aliens who are coming into this country. That does not magically make them legal because Kamala Harris waved the amnesty wand. That makes her border policy a disgrace, and I'm still going to call people illegal aliens. This And, and just think, I mean, think about the shamelessness required from Kamala Harris. Temporary protective status. That is Kamala Harris through a government edict saying you're not allowed to deport people anymore. Those Border Patrol agents who want to do their job, that's Kamala Harris saying you are not allowed to deport people anymore. So Kamala Harris says you can't deport people, and then she says you're also now legal instead of illegal. That is completely bogus. That is straight out of George Orwell. None of us buy it. And here's, here's, here's the final point that I'll make on this. Who, who consented? Who in this room, who in this country consented to allowing millions of aliens to come into this country unchecked, unvetted? None of us did. None of us did. And the game the media has played here, again, this, this two-step that Kamala Harris does, I think it's the most disgraceful thing that she has done her, in her entire campaign. She's going to say, on the one hand, we're going to let in millions of illegal aliens to make your housing costs higher, to make your hospitals overwhelmed, to make your local schools impossible for your children to learn in. She's going to do that, and on the other hand, if you dare complain about it, you are a racist. Kamala Harris, I think that's disgraceful. You ought to have respect enough for your own people to enforce their border laws and listen to them. Listen to them when they complain about it. Don't pretend they're bad people. And look, I, I think I speak... I think I speak for every person in here, and I think I speak for a lot of people, a lot of undecided voters, but certainly a lot of Republicans, independents, and Democrats who are voting for Donald Trump. We are allowed, under the First Amendment to this country, to tell our leaders that they're doing a bad job. We are allowed, Kamala Harris, to tell you you got to stop importing millions of low-wage foreigners into our country. We are allowed, Kamala Harris, to tell you you can't jack up the cost of housing by giving foreigners homes instead of American citizens. We're not bad people for loving this country. You're a bad person for doing this to the country in the first place. Of course, 
Um, you know, we, we've got a crazy political atmosphere and people are asking me how I'm doing, but look, I'm doing great. Don't ever worry about me. This is one of the greatest opportunities, the greatest honors I've ever had in my life. No, and I appreciate that, so I need your prayers. And, you know, I, I talked to the president uh, on Sunday. I've talked to him since then, of course, too. But on Sunday around 1.45, I was sitting at home with my son, my seven-year-old. And the president calls me, and he says, J.D., they just tried to do it again. I said, they did what? He said, they tried to shoot me again. And he kind of told me the story of what would then become public a couple hours later. And, of course, my first thought was, sir, are you okay? I mean, my God, I can't believe this has happened. Physically, clearly, he was okay, or he wouldn't have been calling me. But, you know, you just ask when something traumatic happens, is, 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 are you doing okay? And of course the president was, was doing just fine. He was laughing and joking. It happened five minutes earlier. He hears the gunshots rang out on the golf course. And he's, you know, joshing it up just a few minutes later. And, I, and, I, and the thing that he said was, well, the one thing I'm kind of pissed off about is I was about to make